systematic theology in a nutshell. That means in 30 minutes, I'm going to whet your appetite. Talking and discussing to you about the essence of systematic theology, the gist of it, and why we ought to study systematic theology. And how it blends with other fields that you are studying and that you will study. Allow me to begin by defining theology. Theology is from the Greek word from, two, from a compound Greek word, theos and logos. Theos is God, and logos is the study of God. Systematic theology is the arrangement of biblical message into topics. And you're going to discover there are around 10 subtopics of the entire unit of systematic theology. I am going to highlight to you some of the sources of systematic theology. And you are going to discover that systematic theology is where our education in this college converges and diverges. Everything boils down and it brings it together all to systematic theology. Source number one that we use in systematic theology is the Bible. The Bible is the ultimate source of authority in matters of orthodoxy and practice. That is in matters of doctrine and practice. Therefore, you cannot be a systematic theologian without the Bible. It is your ultimate source of authority. Number two, we have reason. Reason. We use our thinking faculties and our Christian faith is not unreasonable. Therefore, you will discover that philosophy and sociology are main servants of theology. Why? In philosophy, you learn how to reason. Clearly, you learn how to reason without fallacies and mistakes and contradictions. Therefore, one of the sources of theology is reason, and we embrace philosophy. Sociology tells you that man is a social animal. Therefore, as you are going to discover that as you learn theology from reason, and as you study man's behavior in psychology, it becomes a source of systematic theology. It's not only reason, there is also church traditions. Traditions from the apostolic times are a source of systematic theology. Not only that, the creeds, there are two creeds that are acceptable universally. That is the Apostles Creed and the Nicene Creed. There are creeds like Athanasius Creed that some people do not accept it. But they are a source of our theology. There are also articles, including the 39 Articles of Religion, which is a source of authority in our Anglican faith. Church history is also a rich source of systematic theology. And I want to tell you, systematic theology emanates its raw materials are one, exegesis. From exegesis, you get the original meaning of the text, and you get the message of the text. In hermeneutics, you interpret the scripture and the meaning of what the text means to us. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation of the Bible. After you have gotten the original meaning, interpreted the scripture, now you do what we call biblical theology. You get what an entire book or an entire portion of the Bible teaches about a particular topic. Then all this, you put them together and they become the raw material of building this great teaching that is called systematic theology. I have said all these other fields that we study all 
various units and courses. All of them are critical and helpful in building you as a systematic student. Therefore, take each and every one of them seriously. They make you to understand the nature of man. They make you to understand God's creation, how it behaves, and you use them as raw material to build the best theology. But even as we study systematic theology, there is a challenge of the religious language. Sometimes you understand that God is omniscient. God is ineffable. God is powerful. And sometimes we express him in human language. Sometimes it becomes difficult. That's why sometimes as we deal with the problem of religious language, how do you express the infinite God to the finite man who is limited like me and you? That's why we use analogies. We use similes. We use myths, metaphors to explain to God, to explain the message of this infinite God to the finite minds, like me and you. Let's, let me go in a short while to explain some of the basic topics that we are going to study or we have already studied. One is there is what we call the doctrine of scripture. The doctrine of scripture expresses that the scripture, the Bible, is divinely inspired. Faithfully transmitted. First, it is objectively revealed. The Bible is objectively revealed. Divinely inspired. Faithfully transmitted. And it is spiritually verified. Therefore, you must have the correct understanding of the Bible to do the better systematic theology. That the Bible is inspired. Some believe in the infallibility of the scriptures, but I believe in general in the authority of the scripture. It is authoritative in all matters of orthodoxy and practice. And you must understand that there are two kinds of revelation. There is God's general revelation through nature. God reveals himself that's why mwimbaji wa wimbo wa kaimba bwana mungu na shanga have you ever been amazed flabbergasted bewildered mesmerized and fearfully amazed some of you are amazed by mountains some of you are amazed by beauty as you see it true or false even young men here they can think bwana mungu na shanga kabisa nikitaza it's good nature and it is called natural revelation or general revelation. But God's special revelation is through the scripture, the Bible, which is the instrument of that God uses to bring our salvation. Therefore I say it, the first thing we look at is the doctrine of scripture. The scripture is inspired. Can we say the scripture is inspired? The scripture is inspired. And the scripture is authoritative. The scripture, the Bible, is given by, it is by God's initiative and God's act. It is God who revealed himself. And it is his act that inspired, it, 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 it inspired uh, the scriptural inspiration and transmission. And we have the God's one that is in fact verbal and plenary inspired. There is full revelation. Secondly, let's look at the doctrine of creation. Doctrine of creation, we believe that God did not create the world from pre-existent material. We believe that God created the world in creation ex nihilo. That means he created the world from by his own power, he created this world. There are those who believe in the opposite, the evolutionists. The evolutionists believe that the world evolved on its own. But is there a possibility of compromise between the two positions? 
Yes, there are people who say that the six days of creation were not literal days. And in fact, the Bible is not clear. There could have been, it could have been long periods of time. Therefore, since they are not real days, it could be a long period of time, or even ages. That's why there are people who believe in deistic evolution, that God created the original species, but allowed evolution to take it, to take its course and its place. That's why there is deistic and even deistic evolution, where they believe that God allowed the world to evolve on its own until where it is. I will also tell you that there is the doctrine of man that is called anthropology. There are distinct positions on anthropology. That is, man is created in the image and the likeness of what do you mean that man is created in the image and the likeness of God? There are things that show us that man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Among those things, one is your personality. You have a personality like God. You are created in the image of God. Number two, you, don't, you do not only have a personality, you have creativity like God. Number three, you have immortality. Our souls are immortal. And number four, there is the holiness that God imputed in us. But after the fall, after we study anthropology, we go and look at amateology. Amateology is the doctrine of sin. And it says that after man fell, the holiness of God was lost in man. And man became totally is it easy to do bad things or good things? Is it easy to do good things or bad things? Is it easy to be good or bad? Bad because we are by nature sinners. And our nature is fallen. There are some of the things that show us that we are of a fallen nature. Number one. There is the issue of sickness. Sickness reminds us that we are of a fallen nature. You remember those days when everybody was coughing here? Right, left, center. There was a time we were not feeling well. It reminded us that we are of a fallen nature. The sexuality, the sensuality, death are all evidence that we are of a fallen nature. And on our own, we cannot save ourselves. Two theologians differ. One of them is called Pelagius. Pelagius, one of the great theologians, Pelagius says that uh, we are not, we don't have a fallen nature. We choose to sin. Saint Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, says that we are totally depraved. Every inclination of our heart is. Therefore, we are sinners deserving God's condemnation and <clears throat> judgment. From there, we divert and go. Here's the remedies that man is sinful. Where is the remedy? The remedy is found in the doctrine of Christology and soteriology. In Christology, we learn who Christ is. He is with the two natures. He is 100% God and 100% man. That is according to the Chalcedon Concord. If you do not understand that, you will have a serious problem. And you can have heresies coming out of your church, like the heresy of prophetism, where they think Christ did not have a real human nature and he had something that is a phantom that appears to be like the human nature. Because they believe that matter is evil. But the truth of the matter is that God created matter. And it is not inherently evil as the Gnostics or the Dichotomists say. 
And when Christ will learn that he's fully God and fully man, we avoid the heresy of Docetism. We avoid the heresy of, of uh, embionism. We avoid the heresies, all these heresies of Arianism, Saberianism. We avoid all these heresies. Now, let's look at salvation. What are we saved for? Let me include you in this discussion here. What are you saved for? What are you saved for? Who can help you? Yeah, this man has done a bit of the theology, and I thank God he has not forgotten the penalty. Yeah, number one, we are saved from the penalty of sin. All man, because we are sinners, we deserve to go to hell. We deserve divine judgment, but we are saved from the penalty of sin. And that is what we call justification. Where we are counted righteous before God. And that was the watchword of Protestant Reformation. There were five solar. Solar Idei, solar gratia, Sola Scripture, Sola Christus, and there is the last soul. But in the Reformation, we have Sola Idei. We are justified by faith in Christ alone. So we are saved from the penalty of sin. Umiemba umeokoka, know that you are saved from the penalty of sin. Number two, you are saved from the power of sin. And I wanted to repeat that number one is an act that was completed. It's once and for all. Number two, we are saved from the power of sin, which is a process and it is called justification. It is a process. And every day we are being saved. They are referring to justification. Ukisikia mtu ambaye anasema ninaokolewa kila siku, he is referring to sanctification. It is a process where every day we die to sin and live as unto righteousness. It is called sanctification. Where there are people who believe there is a teaching that is called Wesleyan Arminian. They believe. They believe. Once you are just, you will be sanctified one day, and the sin will be completely removed from you, and God will give you pure love, and you will not sin again. But the Catholics and other people, they call, they they use this analogy of 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 the old man, like the old man is waking up every day, and justification is suppressed every time. Sin is suppressed in us. It's suppressed. The urge to sin. And lastly, the process will be a completed act. It's called glorification. Where we will be saved and be changed to be like him. And that is when we get to heaven. So salvation is a completed act. It is a process. It is something that will be completed. There we end. There is something that I did not cover, the doctrine of God. Doctrine of God, we have attributes. And you remember they are communicable and incommunicable attributes of God. The communicable attributes of God are those attributes that God does not share, but it belongs to him. Like the transcendence of God. It is an attribute that belongs to there are many attributes that belong to God. But the attributes that he shares with us, they are called communicable attributes. Love, justice. These are attributes that we share with God. They are called communicable attributes. There is the doctrine of Trinity. Trinity, we believe in Trinity in unity and unity in unity. That implies for God is one in essence, but three in essence. And one person of the Trinity could be in three. 
No food, no food, food being subordinate. But that does not mean they are inferior because they are co equal, co eternal, and co perfect. It is a mystery. Somebody says, try to understand Trinity, you will lose your head. Try to ignore it, you will lose your mind. The Trinity is Now, we move to systematic religion. And we will start the doctrine of what is called pneumatology. Pneumatology is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we discover that the Holy Spirit is the person of the divine Trinity. The person of the divine Trinity. He's co equal, co eternal, co creator. He's God the Father and the Son. He was subordinate, but he did not imply inferiority. We discover that the Holy Spirit is a person, not a force. And the acts that he commits are done by the person. He can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be deceived. You cannot deceive electricity. Is it possible to deceive electricity? No, but you deceive a person. So the Holy Spirit is a divine person. And in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we learn about how the Spirit is related to Christ and is called the Spirit Holy Spirit was critical in Jesus' baptism. Back, baptism, ministry, death, and even resurrection. But there is a phenomenon that is so common and we cannot avoid it. This phenomenon is the Pentecostal movement. Everyone is affected. There are some positive things. They brought excitement in the church. But there are challenges with Pentecostals and the charismatic movement. Let's recall them the charismatic movement. Some of them brought emphasis on speaking in tongues. Some of them brought emphasis on healings and miracles. And some of them manipulated. So we must know, even the Anglican church, even your local church is affected by the Pentecostal movement. In the 19th century, there was the revival and the recrudescence of the Pentecostal movement. Speaking in tongues, the emphasis, the unhealthy emphasis on speaking in tongues is a reality. So you must know how to combat this. Now let's look at the church. The church is ecclesia, derived from the German word kirk, from the Greek kuriakon, which means of. That which is the ecclesia is a group that God called out of the world into his kingdom. The church is a gathering community where people gather to worship, to teach, and to be equipped. But it is a scattering community where people are scattered to go and do evangelism, mission, and social. The church is where we are. There is a saying, Mimi siye ni kanisa kwa sababu ni oyangu ni kanisa yangu. Is that true? Yeah? That cannot be true because the church is a body of believers. Lastly, there is something that is called there is something that is called, there is something that is called eschatology, the study of the end times. The study of the end times is the doctrine that Christ will come. His coming will be sudden, will come like a thief. It will be a visible coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, indeed and truly, he is going to come. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We discuss the 1,000 years, the millennium, and there are three views. The pre-millennium, there are those who believe that Christ will come before 1,000 years peaceful reign here on earth. It's called the Chileanism. When you look at Anglicanism, it was condemned in the 42 articles of religion. But when they were reduced to 39, it was left out. So the Anglicans are silent in the 1,000 years. But there are people who believe that Christ will reign in this world 
for a field of 1,000 little women. There people who believe, no, that is not what will happen. There, the gospel will be preached and Christ will come after the millennium. But after the Second World War, most of the people left that position. That one is called a millennium. There will be no millennium. That means the 1,000 years of Christ here on earth, the 1,000 years of Christ here on earth will not be literal, it will not be whatever, that is the church end. Now let me conclude the essence of why I'm saying this. Every unit that we study will relate to one another. And my purpose here is to say that as you study Old Testament and New Testament material, you relate it to Exodus, where you find the essence of the biblical message. And you will relate all these studies to other humanities, whose philosophy, which is a handmade subject of theology. It makes you, and you relate it to sociology. And you relate it to pastoral theology, or DPM, dimensions of pastoral ministry. All these education that you are learning here, all of them somehow are related. Despite the fact that you are studying at different times, different events, by different lectures, but I want to tell you they are all related. Make you a better theologian, a better minister, and a better Christian. To deal with human beings because you have learned sociology. To handle issues because you have done dimensions of pastoral ministry. From philosophy you learn ethics and you handle ethical issues. Therefore, I challenge you that as you are listening to teach, study with all diligence. Every unit is critical and important, and it will make you a better servant of God. To serve God and to serve humanity. I am here to employ you. As I told you, what is the nutshell of systematic theology and the essence of our study here in this institute. Thank you very much for listening to me and may the Lord richly bless you.